This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning, everybody. Happy Friday. Um, for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Peyton Hansen. I'm one of the first year fellows uh, in our clinical track. Uh, and today I'll be discussing a case of uh, syncope in a 17 uh, year old elite athlete with a case um, with a topic discussion uh, to follow. I have unfortunately no disclosures. So we're going to present a case uh, of a 17 year old elite athlete who presented with syncope. Uh, we're going to discuss expected electrical and structural features of exercise induced cardiac remodeling, aka athlete's heart. Uh, we're going to review physiologic remodeling of cardiac tissue to different forms and stressors of exercise. Uh, we're going to discuss workup to distinguish between uh, uh, athlete's heart and cardiomyopathy or pathology, uh, including some echocardiographic and advanced uh, imaging features. Um, so to get into our case, uh, a 17-year-old male without prior significant medical history was brought to Grady via EMS following a medium-speed motor vehicle accident. Uh, he was traveling 45 to 50 miles an hour when his vehicle hydroplaned and he hit the median, airbags deployed. Um, he didn't really suffer any injury, but upon exiting the vehicle and calling a friend, he experienced a brief loss of consciousness with fall and was brought to the Grady Emergency Department for further care. In presentation, he was shaken by the event, but not in apparent distress, reported only facial pain. Further history, uh, he plays basketball year-round, including rigorous endurance and strength training, uh, no syncopal or presyncopal events at practice, no palpitations uh, either. Uh, he had excellent exercise tolerance, and he was at peak conditioning. This was in the winter season during basketball season. Uh, he reported no illicit or performance-enhancing drug use, and he had no family history of sudden cardiac death. His initial workup was notable for stable vital signs. Uh, he was 5'9", 175 pounds, muscular build. Uh, he was alert and oriented, normal cephalic, some mild facial pain uh, to palpation. Cardiovascular exam was benign, as was pulmonary exam and, neuro and neurology exam. Uh, his workup was notable for a normal basic metabolic panel, panel and CPC. A high sensitivity troponin was 48. CPK was 417. Uh, AST was 48. Uh, his liver function tests otherwise were within the limits of a normal. Uh, a urine drug screening was negative. Trauma survey was performed due to the motor vehicle accident in the fall. Uh, a CT head showed no acute intracranial process, a minimally displaced left orbital floor fracture. CT chest, abdomen, pelvis was notable for no acute injury, but a borderline enlarged heart. Uh, chest x-ray uh, was also uh, not suspicious for any acute process. And this was his initial EKG, uh, which is quite notable and quite abnormal. Uh, we'll talk about it once we more, get more into the body of the talk. Uh, so it's notable for sinus rhythm uh, with uh, frequent PACs. Uh, EKG evidence of left ventricular hypertrophy by Sokolo Leon criteria. Um, and what really stuck out to me about this EKG was the uh, was the convex ST segment elevation in combination with J point elevation, as well as uh, lateral T wave inversions in the late precordial leads, uh, as well as the inferior leads. And you'll notice the J point elevation also uh, extends out into the high laterals one and AVL. Um, repeat EKG about six hours later um, uh, was notable for largely the same uh, and unchanged from his presenting EKG. And it was at this point, uh, it was about four in the morning by this point, that cardiology was uh, phoned for recommendations um, uh, about his care. Uh, and the consult service followed him. We'll talk about his, his course. Uh, continue workup was notable for a serial troponin of 55 to 44 to 39, so downtrending. Uh, and uh, BNP was five. Uh, he continued to deny chest pain and was otherwise asymptomatic. Um, I was actually the fellow on call at you know, four when they woke me up about this EKG. And first thing I did was panic and a young guy with a mildly high troponin and his, and his injury. Um, but I was able to get both the patient and his mother on the phone to exonerate chest pain. And, you know, I think the most reassuring thing in the world you can hear as a cardiology fellow on, on call at night is that a mother, uh, she said, quote, I am not, my baby's okay. And he's not having chest pain. So that was uh, reassuring at that point. And so, um, uh, we continued to work him up the, the following morning. 
Um, he, however, did experience a second syncopal event while emulating to the bathroom in the clinical decision unit. Uh, telemetry uh, from this event was kind of unfortunately marred by baseline artifact and not quite very useful. Um, but otherwise, telemetry was only notable for frequent PACs and rare sinus pauses. Um, transthoracic uh, echo was performed the following morning, um, which we'll watch some videos here. You can see a parasternal long axis. Um, normal, grossly normal systolic function. Uh, his uh, septal uh, thickness was measured at 1.2 centimeters and his uh, left ventricular cavity size in diastole was measured at 4.5 centimeters. Uh, here's a parasternal short. Um, again, you note some uh, findings concerning for LVH, normal, grossly right ventricular size and intact systolic function. Uh, apical four chamber view here, again, uh, findings concerning for left ventricular hypertrophy, normal size left atrium, normal size right atrium. Uh, we did get some contrasted images as part of the study as well. Redemonstrated um, is mild uh, left ventricular hypertrophy. Um, as you can tell in this uh, parasternal long, the apex isn't super well visualized, um, which we were able eventually to get uh, what we thought was an off-axis shot of his uh, of his apex uh, with these contrasted images um, measured up to 1.3 to 1.4 centimeters actually. Um, so there were some findings uh, concerning for possible asymmetric left ventricular hypertrophy. Um, so we'll have a summative statement here, um, basically being a 17 year old black male athlete without significant past medical history, um, but presented with multiple single events following a motor vehicle accident and was found to have diffuse T wave inversions lab evidence of myocardial injury and uh, left ventricular hypertrophy on uh, TTE. And I include that summative statement for those of you who are like me and are usually just tuning in uh, at this point, uh, just to catch everybody up. Um, so at this point, a diagnostic test was performed. Uh, however, before we get into that, I would like to have a uh, topic discussion on, uh, excuse me, uh, we'll talk about our differential diagnosis first. Um, at the top of our differential at this point was hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, perhaps with an apical variant um, due to his floridly abnormal EKG, the syncopal history, um, and the evidence of LVH on his, on his echo. Um, diagnosis 1A was exercise-induced cardiac remodeling, or the athlete's heart. And uh, it's these two entities which we're largely going to focus on today. At this point, things we thought were far less likely were blunt cardiac injury uh, based on his lack of chest pain, uh, though suspicion remained given the mildly low, mildly uh, the low-grade troponin elevation or uh, traumatic LAD, LAD dissection, which was thought to be much less likely uh, given his lack of chest pain and overall mild cardiac injury. Though notably, uh, the uh, LAD is the vessel most commonly injured uh, in uh, motor vehicle accidents when the coronary arteries are injured, uh, just to note. Um, so before we get into the diagnostic testing and the outcome of this case, I'd like to have a, a topic discussion on distinguishing athlete's heart from cardiomyopathy. Uh, uh, basically trying to discern what are horses uh, from zebras. Um, and really, the more I read about this topic, the more it became clear to me that it's less like horses and zebras and more like needles and haystacks as far as trying to discern which athletes have um, you know, possible underlying cardiomyopathy. Uh, you're looking at a sea of probably normal hearts and in some ways, super normal hearts. Um, and uh, oftentimes in that sea of people, there's you know, you know, one or two that, that you'll find pathology and it, and it has implications for management, uh, particularly with sudden cardiac death. Um, so we'll talk quickly about some definitions. Uh, physical activity is just any body movement resulting in contraction of skeletal muscles. So to get here today, I perform physical activity. Um, exercise is any plan, structured, repetitive action that is used to maintain or improve physical fitness and or health. Most of these participants are seeking only to maximize their physical and psychological health and wellness. And this group does include uh, most casual endurance and ultra endurance participants. Uh, the majority of this talk will focus on competitive athletics where a high premium is placed on achievements and performance, 
uh, systematic training and optimal performance is uh, of higher importance than the actual exercise you're obtaining. Uh, so we're going to focus more on this group of people rather than the casual exercisers. The first thing I learned about uh, exercise-induced cardiac remodeling is it is largely limited to elite athletes. So unfortunately, uh, you know, me, Andrew Murphy, Matthew Brown are not getting athletes heart from uh, going out and playing pickleball uh, on the weekends. Um, so uh, Definition of athlete's heart, a constellation of electrical and structural changes that occur in the heart of individuals who train for prolonged durations or high intensities. Uh, we'll get into really the electrical changes and the structural changes that we expect to occur um, as, uh, as, we move, as we move forward. Um, so first we'll talk about electrical or EKG adaptations. Um, and we'll talk first about um, the international guidelines uh, for uh, interpreting EKGs in athletes. Uh, this was compiled in 2017, um, a summit of sports cardiologists, including Aaron Bagish, one of my old attendings, and Sanjay Sharma, um, got together and put together a set of guidelines, which I would encourage which I would encourage uh, any of our fellows to read. I thought it was really enlightening. I thought it was an important uh, uh, resource for me as I put together this talk. Uh, and they outlined uh, some normal variants and some abnormal variants um, that we'll discuss. So the normal variants first, and a lot of this is self-evident, um, first being sinus bradycardia, sinus arrhythmia, first degree AV block, Mobitz 1, ectopic atrial rhythm, LVH by voltage. It's common in athletes and is present in isolation and hypertrophic cardiomyopaths in less than 2% of cases. RVH as well, also common, can be present in up to 13% of athletes. And in isolation does not correlate with any significant pathology. Um, also benign early repole we're all familiar with, plus or minus these tall peak T waves. Um, that's present in up to 45% of Caucasian athletes and you know, a higher proportion of black athletes. And we'll talk about, uh, as we move along in this talk, kind of some racial differences um, in some unexplained racial differences, uh, some yet unexplained racial differences in uh, phenotypes. So here's an uh, example EKG. Here you can see kind of sinus bradycardia, um, uh, diffuse J-point elevations, um, uh, with some tall peak T waves. This is a benign EKG in an athlete and does not warrant uh, any further workup. Um, this next uh, EKG is quite interesting. It's called a repolarization variant um, and is really largely defined by convex ST elevations and come with J point elevations in the early precordial leads with deep T wave inversions. Um, this is a benign EKG finding, particularly in highly trained athletes. Um, you may see this referred to as black athlete repolarization variant, uh, even in the guidelines, though there is a lot of recent movement away from this term um, as we've, uh, as there's been more research showing that this is present in also Caucasian, uh, Hispanic, Latin American athletes, um, and that the term black athlete repolarization variant was more racially charged uh, and less explained under underlying physiology uh, than we would like. Um, I would note that expansion of this pattern into the lateral or inferior leads is considered pathological until proven otherwise and does warrant comprehensive workup. Uh, and that's due to uh, studies that show us that about four to five percent of patients with that EKG pattern uh, will go on to develop uh, some uh, clinically elevant cardiomyopathy. Uh, and this will become relevant later in our talk. Um, also relevant are juvenile T waves. Um, this is the point in the talk which I dangerously uh, got close to starting talking about pediatric EKG interpretation, but we'll only put a pinky toe into this realm. Uh, this is just isolated T wave inversion uh, in the early precordial leads at athletes aged less than 16 years. You might be asked to evaluate patients like this in our Marcus Trauma Center. Um, this is considered normal and warrants no further workup. Uh, briefly on the abnormal variants, uh, I'm not going to spend I'm going to spend a little bit of time here, but I don't need to tell you to work up um, ST elevations or Q waves or floridly abnormal EKGs or high grade AV block, but just a few abnormal variants that uh, might catch your eye when evaluating the athletic patient. Uh, first off, like we discussed in the previous slide, so this lateral extension of these precordial T wave inversions. So you'll notice that in this patient, there are um, late lateral um, ST segment depressions associated with deep T wave inversions, uh, which extends into the inferior and the high lateral leads. 
Um, this uh, pattern is considered cardiomyopathy until proven otherwise. Um, uh, and there is actually an EKG um, correlation with the type of cardiomyopathy that's expressed. So inferior and lateral lead involvement um, would be more commonly seen in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, whereas right in the early precordial leads, so such as V1, V3, um, this, this pattern of EKG abnormality would be more commonly seen in uh, arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy in the absence of a true right bundle. Um, so there is some correlation. Obviously, you need more advanced uh, testing to tell. You couldn't make the diagnosis solely off of EKG, but uh, just interesting to note. Um, another uh, pattern that is considered abnormal is uh, adult anterior T-wave inversion. Uh, we discussed in the previous slide, uh, in the previous slides about juvenile T-wave inversions. Persistence of that past really age 18, along with again, extension into the late precordial leads uh, does warrant uh, further testing. Uh, here you see um, uh, EKGA is uh, one of the benign variants we discussed, that precordial T wave inversion, J point elevation with convex ST segment elevations is often a normal variant in athletes of all races. Um, and then EKGB here shows diffuse precordial T wave inversions along with a mild downsloping ST segment uh, and the absence of J point and ST elevations, uh, which is actually more um, uh, pathological. The, um, the presence of J point and ST elevations in EKGA uh, is actually quite reassuring against uh, um, underlying cardiomyopathy. Uh, so here we have a summation slide. Um, largely will be common sense to most faculty and fellows. Um, I just wanted to highlight a few of the patterns that we talked about, um, such as this ST um, diffuse, this anterior ST segment elevation um, and V1 to V4. Um, again, this is from the 2017 guidelines in which um, this was predominantly noted in black athletes. Um, there's since been research showing that this is present in athletes of all races, um, so I would expect that this wording to be removed in updated guidelines, uh, but just worth noting. Um, and also a normal variant of the juvenile T waves. Um, abnormal EKG findings uh, being diffuse T wave inversions um, and greater than two PVCs on a strip. Um, one to two PVCs is allowable and doesn't typically indicate underlying cardiomyopathy, greater than two, you start to start worrying about uh, structural heart disease and we want to work those patients up further. Um, so now we've talked about electrical adaptations. Let's talk a little bit about echo and structural adaptations um, to, um, to exercise, to strenuous exercise. Um, so we'll start off with some definitions. So dynamic exercise is considered a more your endurance type activities so requiring regular contraction of large muscle groups. Uh, this activity is characterized by the relative percentage of maximal aerobic power or percentage of maximal oxygen uptake that is achieved by the athlete. And the primary physiologic issue here is volume. So these are your endurance runners. These are your soccer players. They have, uh, they're traveling long distances over long amounts of time. They need to augment their cardiac output um, for a long amount of time. And uh, the, uh, the heart is going to be primarily dealing with a volume issue here. Uh, and that's in stark contrast to static exercise. So these are strength type activities such as weightlifting that require the athlete to perform sustained muscle contractions. Um, this intensity is characterized by the relative percent percentage of a maximal voluntary contraction or muscle recruitment often against a closed glottis, which is associated with uh, very high um, transient increases in blood pressure. It's been noted that uh, during a bench press, a closed glottis bench press an athletes uh, systolic blood pressure can achieve levels of up to 300 uh, millimeters of mercury. And the primary physiologic here is primary physiologic issue here, obviously being pressure. Um, and this is well, um, kind of defined, uh, this is actually adapted from the 2015 return to exercise guidelines for athletes with cardiomyopathy. And I think it actually really well captures um, the spectrum of um, dynamic versus static components of exercise. As you'll see, um, when you start talking about an increasing dynamic component, that's an increase in uh, endurance of primarily a physiologic volume issue. Um, as you go rightward on this diagram, as you go up on this diagram, this involves more muscle recruitment, more strain, uh, more um, 
more uh, squeeze against uh, an elevated systemic blood pressure. So you'll see on one extreme over here in a high static component, you have things like uh, weightlifting and bodybuilding, whereas a high dynamic component um, is um, more soccer, cross country running and solely isolated endurance activities. Um, and the structural adaptations to these are also kind of pretty well represented on, um, on a um, kind of a, a, a spectrum here. Uh, as you increase your dynamic component, as we talked about, your uh, physiologic volume issues become higher. You get more eccentric LV remodeling and right ventricular dilation. Uh, these are the patients that tend to, tend to present with a mildly dilated uh, transthoracic echocardiogram. And you'll see as we uh, talk about increasing the static component of our exercise, that's much more in line with concentric LV modeling. So these patients um, uh, that deal with strictly static um, actually have very little change in their volume load and um, transient often very high elevations in their systolic blood pressure. When you get here into the Northeast portion of the chart, um, uh, Athletics like swimming, rowing, cycling, uh, sports that involve a high amount of both endurance and strength are when you really start to get some uh, what we call the abnormal structural um, athletes' hearts, where they have both concentric and eccentric LV remodeling and bichamber dilation. Um, and these patients are often the ones that need uh, the most thought put into their care. Um, and just to highlight this a little bit more, I've, overlay, I've overlaid the two charts um, here. And I think it's also worth noting at this point um, that um, in, in talking with Jonathan Kim and developing this talk, uh, there's a lot of movement away actually from such strict um, classification of sports in a diagram like this because it fails to capture um, positional changes uh, that may be uh, evident, particularly in team sports. So if you think about American football, uh, when you have an offensive lineman whose primary uh, role on the team is to be large, be strong, lift lots of weights and move other people around, he's going to be more in the, uh, in the 3A section of this chart as far as a high static component, a low uh, dynamic component to his exercise, where if you compare him to such someone such as a wide receiver or a defensive back, someone whose um, skills are much required to have a lot of um, uh, endurance, speed, and less strength training, he's going to be more in the in the 2C section of this chart. Um, uh, and also, you think something about um, soccer, you know, there's a lot of difference between the physiologic load of a goalie and that of a forward. Uh, and there was definitely a reason why I enjoyed playing goalie more as a child. A um, lot less aerobic load there. Um, so I think that this uh, slide actually really accurately captures a lot of the remodeling that we would expect in athletes. Um, so let's we'll talk a little, about, a little bit about um, LVH as an adaptation, uh, as well as left ventricular dilation. We'll first talk about LVH. Um, this is actually first uh, well described um, in a pretty uh, high impact paper at the time, a 1988 publication in the New England Journal of Medicine, analyzing the Italian Olympic team um, of about a thousand athletes. And the incidence that they noted was about 1.7%, um, almost all of which were rowers, uh, canoeists, and one was a cyclist. Again, getting back into the previous slide uh, where this is a combined um, endurance and strength sports. Um, obviously a lot of flaws with this study, uh, the predominance of uh, European and white descent a really limiting application to a larger population. Uh, but based on this study, um, LV thickness greater than 12 millimeters was considered the upper limit of normal for, for athletic hypertrophy. This obviously uh, led to misdiagnosis um, for patients of non-white descent, as we'll talk about. Um, and there are racial differences uh, in LVH phenotype um, that weren't super well delineated um, until really the early and mid 2000s. Um, this was, I thought, a really well done study of the uh, UK Olympic training program in which they took 300, um, only males, unfortunately, but 300 elite black male athletes uh, and compared them to 300 white athletes in the same program with controls being sedentary, uh, white and black individuals um, of each race. Uh, a mean age across all subjects was 21. Uh, and they noted that the black athletes developed LVH more frequently and to a greater degree. 
Um, and here in this study, LVH was defined as LV wall thickness greater than 12 millimeters. Um, the black athletes um, developed it 18% uh, of the time versus 4% in the white athletes as a highly significant value. Um, and even nine uh, expressed um, more severe LVH beyond 15 millimeters. And you'll see um, on the chart here, just a rightward shift uh, when compared to their, to their Caucasian and European descent peers. Um, and this persisted across all sports. So it wasn't like this was um, strictly isolated to some, something like soccer or track and field or basketball. Um, and is also um, noted that they more commonly met, unsurprisingly, uh, LVH criteria on EKG, 68% uh, versus 40% of their uh, peers of European descent, and had more repolarization abnormalities. Um, the most common being ST segment elevations um, and deep T wave inversions. And interesting to note that these changes were not easily explained by basal or exercise blood pressure readings between the two groups. Um, which gets us to really kind of like why LVH is more frequently expressed uh, in black athletes than in white athletes. Um, and I, I really wanted to put together something solid for this slide, but there's not a great explanation at this point as to why uh, this is more common in athletes of Afro-Caribbean or African descent. Um, it's not easily explained by genetics. It's not easily explained by basal blood pressure readings. There's some hypotheses out there that uh, perhaps socioeconomic stress and higher baseline adrenergic tone, perhaps changes um, variations in salt consumption, even in the absence of hypertension could contribute. Um, uh, at this point, there's not great data to support claiming um, uh, one either way. Um, and I think just saying a blanket statement like black athletes uh, develop LVH more frequently would be akin to um, the now kind of defunct uh, GFR estimations in black patients um, that really have no basis uh, in biology um, and rather more investigation is needed uh, kind of on this subject. Um, so now we'll move into left ventricular dilation. Um, important to note that LV dilation is common, particularly in sports with a high amount of dynamic training. Um, it may be associated even with a mildly reduced resting systolic function in these endurance and ultra endurance athletes. Um, balanced dilation on echo of all cardiac chambers or normal and or supernormal diastolic function favor exercise induced cardio rem cardiac remodeling. Um, unbalanced dilation or abnormal diastolic function would favor, of course, cardiomyopathy in this instance. Um, one thing that can be used to discern between the two is stress echo um, with an ejection fraction increase of greater than 11% from rest or an EF obtained of greater than 63% peak exercise favoring athlete's heart as opposed to underlying cardiomyopathy. Uh, and this was uh, pretty well delineated in one of the uh, European journals of echocardiography, um, wherein you see uh, athletes with an LV dilation, uh, healthy athletes with LV dilation, um, athlete controls that were had normal resting ejection fraction is ejection fractions and patients with asymptomatic mild dilated cardiomyopathy were compared against each other. And we'll uh, dissect this study out just a little bit further in the coming slides. Um, so there were 35 asymptomatic mild dilated cardiomyopathy patients compared to 25 gray zone individuals, which is defined as a healthy athlete with mild LV dilation and EF of less than 55% on TTE. Important to note that this is a gray zone. This is not talking about patients with moderate or severe LV dilation or severe left ventricular systolic dysfunction. Uh, this is more the mild LV dilation with only uh, a mild decrement in systolic function where we where the gray zone becomes applicable. Uh, these patients were compared also to 25 healthy controls. They underwent BNP measurement, EKG, Holter, and exercise echo. Uh, this was a relatively young population, an average age of 39, um, and their LVs on average were only mildly dilated. Uh, the mean left ventricular uh, internal diameter at diastole was six centimeters. Um, and the mean LVEF between the gray zone and the dilated cardiomyopathy patients was about 48%. Uh, and so here, um, to go back real fast, um, so this is uh, the chart on the left is looking at peak uh, LVEF obtained during stress echo. As you'll see, the athlete controls obviously um, had no decrements in their LVEF and the uh, gray zone athletes tended to also not have decrements in their left ventricular ejection fraction, whereas the dilated cardiomyopathy patients um, either suffered uh, 
uh, struggled to uh, augment their LVEF or had LVEF um, ejection fraction decrements uh, throughout stress echo. Um, and this is a relative change, uh, percent change in ejection fraction. Again, you see um, uh, that 96% uh, of these gray zone athletes were able to augment their EF by greater than 11%. 92% um, uh, looking at the uh, last slide achieved a peak EF of greater than 63%, excuse the typo. Um, and the dilated cardiomyopathy patients, only 22% were able to augment their ejection fraction by greater than 11. Um, and only 17% could get an EF of greater than 63. Uh, so this was also pretty sensitive and specific for dilated cardiomyopathy, uh, being 75% and 90% respectively, talking about failure to augment or achieve a peak, or achieve a peak normal ejection fraction. Um, so that really established this uh, stress echo as a way in which you can uh, discern between pathologic dilated cardiomyopathy and perhaps just healthy athletic variant. Um, whether or not uh, arresting L LVEF of less than 55% portends a predisposition to develop cardiomyopathy is not quite known. So whether or not this represents some sort of pre-disease state that doesn't, is not yet expressed is not uh, well delineated. And so this was a flow chart for workup that they recommended as part of, as, uh, as a result of this study. Um, as you'll know, a lot of this seems like common sense, um, mostly noting that um, in their experience uh, in these gray zone patients um, with mildly dilated LV um, and an EF of less than 55, um, BNP measurements, EKG, and Holters were not horribly discerning between the two. It was actually excellent at ruling in the athlete's heart, but was poor at ruling out cardiomyopathy. Um, so while at a normal BNP, normal EKG, and normal Holter usually ruled in uh, athlete's heart, it did poorly at ruling out dilated cardiomyopathy. And, and once you got down to exercise echo, um, that was the point at which... Uh, um, dilated cardiomyopathy uh, began to be ruled out in a significant way, um, with cardiac MRI obviously being the uh, tiebreaker um, for patients in whom the diagnosis is still yet unknown. So now that we've talked about some electrical structural changes of athlete's heart, I'd like to take us back to our index case uh, and to summarize for those um, and to just uh, summarize uh, the case. 17-year-old um, black male athlete without past medical history. I came in with a few syncopal events following a motor vehicle accident. He was found to have concerning EKG findings of diffuse T-wave inversions associated with ST segment depressions, as well as uh, um, uh, convex ST segment elevations in early precordial leads, uh, some mild myocardial injury, and LVH on his TTE. Um, and sp strictly sp speaking towards this patient, his gray zone falls under the far left of this chart with clinical factors that would favor athlete's heart being a balanced um, left ventricular hypertrophy, um, a sport like his with a lot of isometric physiology. So note that uh, basketball players often train uh, in multiple ways, both dynamic and static. He did have a normal systolic blood pressure uh, and did not have any family history. However, his EKG was markedly abnormal um, and he had a concerning clinical history as well as a concerning, um, uh, we didn't discuss this much in the case, but his tissue Dopplers weren't of great quality, but did raise some concern about diastolic dysfunction. Um, and so we'll, in the next slide, we have some um, features that favored. Um, so our clinical reasoning here, um, things in his case that favored hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where he had a, actually on echo a, a borderline small LV cavity. He had, did have a bizarre uh, and abnormal EKG pattern. Things that favored athlete's heart, uh, where he did not have focal LVH, it appeared more diffuse, though the apical uh, visualization, visualization was difficult. He had a normal left atrial uh, diameter. Uh, he did not have a family history of hyper, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, there was some question about abnormal diastolic function. It was really more borderline in his study, and we didn't really love where the tissue Dopplers were, uh, were located. So um, we didn't put a lot of stock into his borderline abnormal di diastolic function on the study. Um, 
Again, uh, emphasizing his abnormal EKG and his high-risk clinical presentation, most notably syncope, uh, which really pushed us uh, to perform further diagnostic testing um, in his case. Um, so uh, let's uh, take a look at his cardiac MRI. Uh, and you'll notice that he has a more uh, uniform LVH. It was measured as uh, 1.2 uh, centimeters uh, uniformly. Um, there was no comment on the cardiac MRI as far as um, uh, tapering towards the apex. However, here in, an, uh, in a four-chamber shot, you can see it. Uh, apical tapering. His, his left ventricular size was normal. Right ventricular size was normal. EF was 55%, uh, and his atrial size were normal as well. Um, he also displayed no late gadial, no late gadolinium enhancement uh, to suggest any infiltrative process. Um, fibrosis or scar. Um, so at this point, we felt as though we clinched a diagnosis. Um, again, this is our cardiac MRI read. Um, circumferential LVH, um, more compatible with physiologic remodeling, normal chamber sizes, uh, normal valvular function, and no uh, LGE to suggest fibrosis or scar. And also, importantly, because we considered this as part of our differential diagnosis, uh, there was no evidence of uh, traumatic injury as well. So the final diagnosis in this case uh, was exercise-induced cardiac remodeling, or athlete's heart. However, uh, it is important to note that due to his EKG pattern, uh, this patient actually warrants probably annual TTE uh, and EKG, along with annual cardiology follow-up. Um, uh, as, as we noted earlier, um, patients with that EKG pattern tend to develop uh, have an increased propensity to develop cardiomyopathy with it being present in up to 5% uh, of cases. So actually, as a result of uh, developing this talk, uh, we're getting him plugged into, uh, I actually need to make some calls about him today, uh, as he was seen here in the last month, uh, we're getting him plugged into Jonathan Kim's clinic up at uh, St. Joe's. Um, so case resolution for him, uh, he remained asymptomatic, no syncopal events, telemetry quieted down. Uh, given the normal cardiac MRI, we did not perform genetic testing and he was discharged home to uh, outpatient follow-up. However, um, cardiac MRI is not always the final stop. And uh, briefly here, I'd like to get into a case from the literature uh, in which um, a 18 year old male, also elite athlete um, presented uh, for routine screening. He had no syncope, no family history of uh, cardiomyopathy. Uh, he had this EKG, uh, which as you will remember, um, looks pretty similar actually to our patient's EKG, these diffuse deep T wave inversions that extend laterally and inferiorly. Um, his transthoracic echo showed um, an apical uh, hypertrophy, uh, as you can see actually measuring up to 1.5 centimeters um, uh, with a, a spade pattern uh, potentially in his uh, apex as well for which he underwent uh, cardiac MRI. Uh, to further delineate his hypertrophy, uh, which you'll see here. Um, and between these, these, this slide and the next slide, uh, we'll talk about the clinical utility of the deconditioning. So A is his initial cardiac MRI, B uh, being actually the, the athlete's MRI after 10 months of clinical uh, deconditioning, uh, which was performed because on this next slide, you'll note that the patient had uh, patchy late gadolinium enhancement uh, consistent with the early fibrosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, probably an apical variant. Um, it was unclear clinically how much of his hypertrophy was a result of his athletic training versus his underlying um, genetic testing, which was positive. Um, so he was prescribed um, detraining, actually. Uh, and after 10 months of detraining, he was brought back for a repeat cardiac MRI, uh, wherein this is um, his repeat cardiac MRI is uh, image B here. You'll notice resolution of his hypertrophy. Um, however, you will notice persistence of his patchy uh, late gadolinium enhancement consistent with an underlying cardiomyopathy. Um, which is interesting, the patient remained asymptomatic um, for um, uh, 16 months. Uh, genetic testing was performed after the initial cardiac MRI. It was positive for a de novo mutation of a beta-myosin heavy chain. Family members tested negative. 
uh, he remained asymptomatic uh, for 16 months. He was actually repeat genetic tested due to his lack of symptoms and resolution of hypertrophy on cardiac MRI, but again, tested positive. Um, he then developed presyncope and palpitations almost two years later. Uh, Holter was notable for NSVT for which he underwent uh, ICD implant and is clinically uh, doing well. Again, this is a mini case from the literature and not our index case. So uh, and that leads me to my takeaways, uh, which is uh, athlete's heart is associated with some very training specific and struggle between individuals across sports and within sports uh, based off of their either um, based off of their position or their specific training regimen. Um, athlete's heart can closely mimic pathology and pathology can also closely mimic uh, athlete's heart. And you need a keen clinical judgment needed to distinguish, to distinguish between the two. Uh, the most useful diagnostic test to distinguish the, uh, the hypertrophics from the physiologic remodelings is often uh, cardiac MRI or as delineating um, athlete's heart from uh, a dilated cardiomyopathy, stress echo is often uh, the test of choice um, and clinical history being playing a large role along with provider judgment. Um, so with that, I will represent our learning objectives um, and open for questions and discussions. And these are my citations. Thank you, Peyton. Um, that was uh, a very nice review of a of a very challenging um, topic, and uh, thank you for the kind words at the outset and a little walk down memory lane there. Um, uh, yeah, shout sure. out to John and, and Evan as well from that um, from that wonderful uh, iteration of the her service. Um, yeah, I mean, look, I, I uh, this case is an interesting one. I agree that there are still some red flags that bother me a little bit about this gentleman. Um, uh, you know, that EKG, as you said, is, is very abnormal and, you know, it, I'm very glad that you sort of pointed out that this should not be dismissed as just the athletic heart EKG. It's, it's not typical at all for what we see, um, in an athletic, um, individual's EKG, just the, the diffuse nature of the T wave inversions would suggest the possibility of some underlying pathology. Although we do see patients with very abnormal EKGs and follow them for a long time. Um, and they sometimes develop a cardiomyopathy and sometimes they don't. So there's still, you know, a lot we're learning. Um, uh, and as you said, a cardiac MRI, certainly the presence of, of um, asymmetric hypertrophy or delayed gadolinium enhancement on a cardiac MRI would have, obviously probably clinched the diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but the absence of those certainly does not fully exclude it, you know, certainly early in the course of the disease. Um, so I I'm glad he's, we'll continue to get follow-up and, and shout out to Dr. Kim, who I believe is still up in Indianapolis right now at the uh, NFL combine trying to uh, uh, discern needles from hay um, as we speak, uh, up, mm. up, up there. So, um, but yeah, those are my main, I agree. He, he, he warrants continued follow-up. I mean, I know you said the tissue Doppler Absolutely. quality wasn't great, but you know, typically these patients with athletic heart have hyper normal tissue Dopplers, mm. right? Like tissue Doppler velocities in the, in the twenties or even higher in some patients. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so abnormal tissue Doppler, BKG, the biomarker ele slight elevation, which I guess could be explained by some trauma, maybe from an automobile, you know, minor trauma from an automobile accident. You know, th there's still a few like things. I'm glad he's will continue to get follow up. So, yeah, um, that was one of the things I really enjoyed about this talk. Question from the audience. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. No, sorry. You oh, no, that was one of the things I really enjoyed from this talk is the more that I read about the subject, the more I leaned into this case and learned more about this case and like why this patient um, uh, warrants follow up, which is uh, kind of part of I know why we do these talks, because we, we learn more about the subject. Yeah. Um, and uh, sorry, I'll uh, uh, open for questions. No, no, no. And, and you're right. I mean, it's one of those things that the more you learn, the more you realize, like a lot of things in cardiology, the more you delve into, it, the more you realize that there is a lot of uh, inherent unknowns is, uh, Ankit asked, uh, was strain imaging or strain performed on his echo left ventricular strain? Um, is there much out there about using strain? Yeah, we, we looked at this a little bit, Dr. Kim and I, and, and some other folks, 
the, the, yes, it, it's sort of like a lot of the other findings that, that have been discussed. The general thought on LV strain is certainly an abnormal with good image quality on echo, abnormal left ventricular strain obviously would suggest the presence of some sort of underlying uh, myopathic process, uh, not specific to any in particular, um, but uh, often in in early or mild phenotype of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the left ventricular strain will be quite normal. Um, but you would expect probably hyper normal, much like tissue dobblers. You would expect hyper normal strain numbers in this guy if it was truly athletic heart. So even like normal-ish or low normal strain numbers, it wouldn't even have to be abnormal. Like low normal would sort of maybe get your attention. Um, but again, with all the caveats of image quality, et cetera, on echo. So it's a lot. But we've also found that that abnormal LV strain tends to correlate pretty well with delayed gadolinium enhancement on cardiac MRI. So the absence of delayed gadolinium enhancement, I'd be pretty surprised if his strain was abnormal on his echo. So, yeah. Ping, you know, did they do left ventricular strain. strain imaging? Yeah, strain was attempted. Uh, this is a pretty common problem at uh, Grady and our echo lab. The strain didn't track well and wasn't um, uh, in the proper position. So we didn't use it as part of his yeah. case. I, I, that's a common problem in every echo lab. Yeah. <laughs> Peyton, Stan, Sherman, uh, great talk. I was just a little more concerned about the syncope. Uh, you know, a young person with syncope, PACs, abnormal EKG. Did EP have any input in any of this? Yeah, we we didn't seek their input. Has syncope, uh, like like you said, was quite concerning to us and had raised a lot of alarms and red flag. Uh, red flags, and we wish we'd captured a little bit more useful information on his telemetry. Um, he subsequently uh, kind of worked with PT in a pretty extensive way, um, kind of after the event. And notice syncope was all probably it was all in the immediate uh, kind of post motor vehicle accident. Um, uh, our our hypothesis is that he had a lot of adrenergic surge as part of the uh, as part of the accident, potentially. Then you know when he rested, leading to some sort of um, you know, abnormal uh, autonomic tone when he ambulated. It certainly wasn't something that we felt great about, uh, particularly with the syncope. Um, but he kind of, you know, he he didn't display it over about, you know, he waited around a few days for this cardiac MRI and then had no more, you know, episodes and this telemetry really quieted down. So um, it, it was not something that we ever really clinched a diagnosis for a syncope, unfortunately. Um, and something that that still leaves us begging a little bit and uh, something I think that might actually be of of use for this patient is Holter monitoring, uh, which I don't think was applied to him uh, prior to leaving the hospital. That was a beautiful presentation of a difficult subject. If you take uh, that EKG in that 17 year old, you might ask yourself the question, where did it come from? What was this person's EKG like 15 years before? Yeah. Um, and um, I can tell you that sometimes those EKGs develop. I, Robbie knows that I have this person that uh, I happen to have the EKGs. You go back to 1982 on where it just show, show, <coughs> show, showed uh, prominent voltage and just a little STT wave changes, and it morphed into an EKG very similar to what you had with dramatic SC segment elevation coved upward in the lateral precordial leads with T wave inversion. So uh, it makes you wonder what that EKG in that 17 year old looked when he was like 12. Mm -hmm. And uh, is that pattern of development something abnormal? And uh, this patient of mine developed into full blown, blown epic apical hypertrophy. That's what I thought you were going to say or i thought you're going to say that uh, there was some sort of asymmetric septal hypertrophy maybe even in the posterior wall versus the septum mm -hmm. um uh but that turned out not to be the case and i i i agree with the howevers that you had on a couple of occasions there which puts a question mark by this young man and for him to go back out on the football field and play really hard is this is a difficult decision. I know you and Jonathan and other people in sports cardiology are uh, scratching their heads hard about what to do about 
that situation. But that was a great presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Clements. I really appreciate it. I mean, so one thing we know is that, the, like Dr. Clements was alluding to, the electrocardiographic changes and often precede the structural changes um, in patient with uh, particularly inherited cardiomyopathies. So, yeah. you know, that's that's why you're, you're having them follow up with someone, which, you know, we all completely agree with. I mean, you, we just don't know. This guy may end up with a completely normal heart or, or, or not, but that's why you, you sort of, there's just enough red flags there. It's like, eh, you know, this guy needs follow up. We need to, we need to watch this guy. In terms of like participation, you know, you know, the pendulum swung back and forth. And again, Jonathan's the, the real expert on this, but we, we've, a, we've adopted a much more sort of uh, patient centered, a little more uh, uh, forgiving approach, if you will, to participation in athletics. So, I mean, I, with this guy's relatively normal workup, there certainly wouldn't be any reason to disqualify this young man from participation, just obviously with continued sort of follow up and maintenance and certainly buy in, you know, if you were like on the, you know, let's say you were like a, on the Georgia tech basketball team, you know, or something like this, then, then it's like, all right, well, the people of Georgia tech need to be aware of that, you know, the, the training staff, the coaching staff, et cetera, need to be aware. There's maybe something going on that we're following him, but certainly nothing that he would be um, uh, disqualified from participation based on this, you know, yeah, absolutely. And I think it, and you know, as you said, kind of just having the training staff be aware in the worst case scenario that something were to happen, um, having, you know, trained knowledgeable personnel for a prompt resuscitation could lead to good outcomes as we've seen with, um, you know, LeBron James son and, you know, DeMar Hamlin, certainly uh, with those uh, successful resuscitation efforts, you know, in, you know, I don't think this would happen to this kid, but, you know, in, in the event that the worst would happen, um, having someone who is uh, well-trained and uh, aware and on top of the, on top of the situation. I think we've been so, so one, one, one last comment. Uh, one of the difficulties in this area is the fact that, that the decision-making is the plus or minus. It's such a life altering uh, thing for these, these individuals that it really puts a pressure on uh, those helping make that decision. So uh, that really makes it tough. Absolutely. I was just going to say, this, this, this is Neil Dickard. I, I, um, so Jonathan and I submitted a grant actually today looking at um, issues related to trying to develop um, approaches to enhance communication about these kinds of decisions. So it's, a, it's an issue that we're working on a lot. The one thing I would add to the discussion that, that uh, uh, is, is just, it's gotten, as Robbie mentioned, the attitudes have changed, not not just because of appreciation of lower risk in certain phenotypes, but also because of the lack of clear linkage between activities and events. So then Jonathan gave a talk a few weeks back talking about the LIVHCM data, for example, that showed that we do know these folks have some increased risk, but the association between athletic activity and their risk is not as tight as has previously been thought. So that that's made, in some ways, that makes the participation decision a lot easier um, and in other ways it makes it more complex. You know, the other thing is the stand again and having an auto accident and having syncope, uh, you know, raises the question of, uh, did that have anything to do with the accident and having had syncope uh, probably shouldn't be driving for a while. Yeah, I think that's a, an, an excellent point. Um, he was pretty clear on uh, his history as far as when his syncope occurred. Um, and uh, but I think that's really a, a really uh, interesting point for following up on him. Um, and I agree. If I was him, I would probably have my, you know, my teammates or, or, or mom lug me around for a little bit just while getting reacclimated and seeing how I did. I think Georgia law is about six months, but uh, but, you know, that's an, another story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, particularly in the seizure, uh, the seizure population. Okay, well, um, thanks again, everybody, for tuning in this morning. Thanks to Peyton for a um, wonderful talk, and um, see everybody next week. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.